Jason, it's your birthday. It's my birthday. birthday. It's your birthday. He's my slightly younger brother. <laughs> what a wonderful world. Do you ever just like scroll through the news and just sing that song to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Not lately. You're fabulous, Dan. I'm, I'm going to hit it. I'm going to hit, I'm gonna hit it. Go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Who hit the button? I did. Me. <laughs> oh, why do you guys look fuzzy to me? Do I look fuzzy to you? Ah, oh, Jesus. This when everything starts to crash. <laughs> yeah, well, it was so good. The show is just the start. Hey guys, is it is it good now? It's perfect. It's perfect. Excellent. Ninety-eight <laughs> percent. That's early. That is early. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the pre-show banter. This is not the webcast. What is it, Deb? What are we doing? Uh, this is pre-show. Pre-show. We just talk about nothing. And Jason always says you show up early, so we show up early, and we show up early, and you show up early. It's a just cycle. I watched yeah. a documentary well, in like two thousand two on recycling. And I stopped recycling at that point. <laughs> yeah, my husband definitely thinks it's they just it's just two times to get trash out of our house. It's, mm-hmm. it's it all goes to the same place. I yeah. I don't know. Cannot confirm or deny that that's true. We used to show this documentary in class because I taught filmmaking, and we would show what is the difference between documentary and propaganda. Mm. And really, documentary is just something that you agree with, and propaganda is something you don't. <laughs> it's just the <laughs> only difference. The exact same thing. It's not good. CJ Cooper SC says recycling is bad. Um, <laughs> it depends. It depends on what documentary you watch. Matt, Joe, oh. is recycling yes. code? Is that an okay thing? Recycling what? Code. Recycling code. I mean, oh, yeah, <laughs> as often as possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm lazy, so everything I can do to make it easier. Guys, it's Jason's birthday. Jason Blanchard, the outlaw. It is his birthday today. So Matt and Joe, you guys work for 40 North. What is 40 That's what North? Tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is 40 North? Yes. Give us a little a little backstory what they tell you, what, where they tell you, you work. <laughs> Joe, you want to do it? <laughs> I was You're waiting for you to sure. like me. So 40 North, it's the brainchild, I guess we could, we could use that term if we want, of uh, Chris Trunser, who was like, he authored the Veil Framework. I know you guys know Chris, but he's done a lot of open source work. And Chris brought me on in about a year and a half ago, then Matt, I think about a year ago, and we do solely offensive security assessments. We do a lot of, like, I mean, red teams, pen testing, like, like Black Hills as well. But we also do a lot of open source work and tooling. And- I actually worked with Chris before 40 North at our previous company. And uh, he was kind of the, the manager, like the leader of the team there. And he was really good. So I uh, followed him here. Followed him to his own company. Yeah. You got an offer to to join. They, <laughs> my yeah. story's a little different. They put a, a posting out to hire, and then I applied. And I had a great call, good interview. And then they were like, I don't think we're going to hire yet, actually. We're not ready. And then I emailed them like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure you guys need to hire. They're like, no. We went back and forth a little bit, but I don't know. I <laughs> somehow got to them. your way in, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the, that was... The social uh, engineering was strong. Didn't you all offer a red team course at some point? Yeah, so we've taught, it's called an intrusion operations, four days. I taught it with Chris last year at Black Hat USA. Mm-hmm. And then we're teaching it in a few weeks at Black Hat Asia. And then yep. I think a little, we are doing our own like virtual training as well. But yeah, so we do, we've got like a red team course, initial access, and then like a, a bridge between like the OSCP and being on a red team. It's like a internal windows pen testing type course too. I just want to talk about your class coming up at Wild West Hack and Theft. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Joe, you're, you're better at this stuff than me. (laughs) 
Uh, sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. So yeah, we're really excited. We're teaching, it's called Initial Access Operations, which is like a personal favorite of mine just because I love social engineering work. And this is like the technical component of that. So how do you actually like, what payloads do you develop? A lot of like hands-on malware, not, not malware, but like the droppers, writing that, coding that, and then thinking through how we can you know, get a foothold in a network. And it's, it's literally just that for two full days. It's stuff we use, very tactical. Personally, I think it's, I mean, it's my favorite course. I don't know how you feel, Matt. You probably like the Red Team course better, but it's a great, it's a good time. It's super lab heavy. Yeah. I do like it just because intrusion access or our like intrusion operations is so long and so intense that it's, it's, it's a lot to teach. I mean, I forgot how many slides. It's like over a thousand slides. I think we have for that course. So it's a yeah, lot to that's, go. Over. That's the four day course. The two day course isn't yeah. that crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you think? Like, yeah, like, two days is a little, a little more manageable. <laughs> next, yeah. but I mean, next, our, next. our whole, our, our philosophy is just like give you guys as much content as we can, and then mm-hmm. expectation is you take it back and you digest it over like the next week or two or so. So. It is jam packed though. Yeah, that's kind of how we structure all of our training is we throw in as much detail into the slides as we can. And it might be, you know, some of them might be just even reference slides where we don't really talk through, it just has a whole bunch of data you can reference and, you know, kind of go through that you know, on your own time. Honestly, for this webinar, is our hope is that there's stuff that people can use like right now. And then there's a few other topics that people can maybe, I'm assuming this is going to be posted later at, with the recording that people can refer back to or uh, do some more research on. But yeah, we love giving just like, like you said, Jason, at 10%, like we try to make everything to 10%, but obviously it can't be uh, but like super, like I can use this right now, like really cool tactical stuff. Yeah. And like one of the things that we love is bring people on that just get practical, like here is hands-on, you can use this right now. Cause there's sometimes you go to a webcast and it's, it's really just a 50 minute vendor pitch. And you're like, oh, darn. Yep. But we don't like doing that. So thank you for being a part of the Wawa's Hack and Cast series that we're doing here. <laughs> thanks guys. And thanks for a great speech at Wild West as well. We're excited to have you. You no, know, it's my favorite topic, right? We're 14 days out from the last, last Tech and Fest. Yeah, no, we got this. I know. It's, it's cool. It's cool. But of course, we have 11 training classes total. So if you haven't made your selection, please mosey on over to wildwesthackandfest.com and take a, take a look at what we're, uh, what we're doing. We have the Roundup series that's starting in, on October 22nd. The first one is Adversary Emulation. Right there, we're looking for a call for papers. And just a reminder, all of our training classes do come with six months complimentary access to Cyber Range. Cyber. And you do... <laughs> <laughs> you do get the the training classes. Uh, most of the training classes come with come with thirty days worth of recordings afterwards, so you get access to that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have Matt, Grandy, and Jolie on here. I'm super excited about their presentation. And with that, I'm going to kill mine, and it's all yours. Thank you very much, Deb. Welcome, everyone. I know we're maybe 30 seconds out from starting, but I'm just going to jump into it. So today is all about offensive, malicious Microsoft Office documents and how we're using them in 2020, as the, as the title slide says, to gain a foothold in an enterprise network. And so a lot of people are surprised that we're still even using uh, malicious macros, uh, but we are. But we're doing things a lot differently than it's been done the last 25, 25, yeah, I guess about 25 years. Um, So this is going to be super tactical um, things that you guys can take home and implement either on the offensive or defensive side immediately. 
Some of the research will be ours. Some of the research will not be ours, but obviously we're going to give everybody credit. But this is more just to share with you what we're doing as in the, on a social engineering test, on a red team assessment, on an internal pen test, like whatever it may be that requires us kind of fishing in and getting a foothold. This is what we're actually using. And we wanted to share with you guys and hopefully you guys take home a few uh, nuggets of new information. Oh, you've got the slides, Matt. Yep. Uh, so this is the least important slide. Just briefly, Matt and I both work for 40 North Security. I've taught at Black App before with Chris Trunser. I used to be a full stack developer before that. I was in sales, teaching people how to social engineer in sales, right? So it's like, how do you convince someone on the phone or via email to take some action related to sales versus executing a macro, which is what I do now. So that's my background. And Matt, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. So my name is Matt Grandy, of course. And uh, for the second one, I always like to say that I'm a developer, but a developer within quotes. I like to write stuff until there are no errors. And, and hopefully it'll work. From then on, uh, I did a lot of work with the C Sharp implementation of Eyewitness. Made a loud screen share. I don't know if anyone's used those. Pretty cool tools. But also, I love hiking and backcountry camping. Living in Colorado, I just I love being outside. So that's a little bit about me. So to set the stage for this conversation, just to give you guys some context about how we like to think about maldocs, I'll call them, just you know, basically using macros broadly. There's kind of like five buckets that I, I think are instructive to kind of like look at this through. So the first is, I guess the last on this slide is grayed out. That's CVEs. So we don't use those very often. Still valid. Threat actors will use them, but it's not something we're using that often in our practice. The four that are you can read on this slide are more kind of how we think about things. The first at the top is these novel approaches. Novel not meaning like actually new. So this technology is old but it's a new and interesting way of using some of this older technology. So a perfect example, which we'll share is Excel 4.0 macros, silk files, things like that. Another bucket is how do we send a document into, send a document into a target environment and then host our payload remotely so that we're not sending our payload in to that target environment directly. Next is, thinking about just like how do we stay on top of AV evasion trends? And then last is this scenario where Microsoft says, it's actually not a security vulnerability. This is a feature and it's just by design and how we take advantage of some of those. Okay, so this is my favorite topic. So I'm really excited about this. So XLM macros, this is not VBA. This predates VBA. It's not XML. I did not make a mistake, it's XLM. And if you were to insert a sheet, right, like right click on Excel on a Windows uh, application of Excel, you would see like the right hand side of your screen. It says MS Excel 4.0 macros. And that's not something that I feel like I ever took notice of, but that's what we can, that's what we're going to be talking about and using. Okay, so like why? Why are we going to use this? Well, this is like the, the best example exec calc.exe. Like, it's that easy. Like we can spin up a new process that simply. We can add in command line arguments, like whatever we want to do. It's really that simple to use XLM macros. If, you, if you've used VBA macros, you know that this is like, this looks a lot, a lot cleaner. It's just kind of like using the sum formula in Excel. And so all of this research really stands on the shoulders of Outflank. So these guys did an incredible job, specifically Stan and, and the other folks on his team, discovering this as a vector for security researchers, pen testers, as well as threat actors to use to gain a foothold. So if you're interested in learning kind of like where this all started, granted the technology is super old from 1992, but they really brought it to light in a modern day offensive security environment. And now to walk through a progression of kind of like where we've, we've been with tooling for this. So it started with Outflank and creating this Excel for DCOM. Maybe some of you all have used it to move laterally just to inject shell code. So that's kind of where it started. And then we went through and found that silk files could actually, uh, and that's dot, I believe it's SLK files, can use XLM 
or um, these Ford Auto macros. And then we had Sharpshooter, which embedded this functionality into it. So maybe some of you have used Sharpshooter to develop payloads. If you saw this Silk macro enabled document and weren't sure what it is, like this is what it is. From there, the folks over at Cyber Reason, specifically Philip, did a ton of research to make this from just a 32 bit version to being applicable to 64 bit architectures as well. And then from there, Michael Weber, he's at Bouncy Hat. We'll talk about some of his research later too. He created this tool, Macrome, which is a great tool. And it, I believe it takes you from like a .bin file, so whatever payload you want, all the way to manufacturing a Excel file with the macro in it. And then most recently is a tool that, that we released called Excellent Donut. And this is where it was like purely for red teamers. I want to take a C-sharp DLL template that does process injection run it through a tool and spit out my macro. Like that's all I wanted to do. And that's what we, we developed to work on this. So that's like the arc of kind of how things have gone with this. But the reason I think it's really important to, to learn about now is that, and this is from last line, so a research a report they put out, they've seen a huge spike and everybody has seen a huge spike in threat actors, real threat actors, not just people like us using XLM macros in um, actual phishing campaigns. And yeah, here's another, another example of that. I mean, if you were to do this Google search probably two years ago, it'd be very few results. And now there's just, there's so many. I mean, recent articles, there's malware analysts constantly reviewing postings on VirusTotal. And there's a lot of research on it now. Okay, so why like, yeah, like, okay, that's, this is great. It's an old like macro, but like, why do we care? And full, four points I put down here. I think one of the top, reasons is that AMZ doesn't hook into XLM macros like it does to VBA and others. AV still struggles a little bit with this. It's getting a lot better. Truthfully, when I just started doing some research into this about six, seven months ago, if I uploaded something to VirusTotal, which we don't do very often, but if I did, it barely recognized it. The most recent upload I did, I think like maybe 10 to 12 toolings, tools <laughs> caught it. So it's getting better progressively, as, as you would expect, which is part of the reason we put this research out in the first place. The other thing is that you don't have to send these XLSM files or silk files, which like the silk files are really great, but I've never seen one in actually being used before. So it's nice to use a file format that's a bit more expected. XLS files are older, but I think if you're maybe 30, 35 and up, it's pretty commonplace that you would have seen that earlier in your career. And then the most important thing is that we can do classic process injection with these macros. Okay, so I showed you this exec function before. And then on the next slide, I'm going to show you a couple examples of it actually being uh, in use. So on the right is research by inquest. The left is by hatching. These are actual screenshots of real Excel files that threat actors have used. You can see on the right, they're doing a, just a living off the land, low boss, uh, just one liner. And on the left, there's a lot of text there, but line 12 is the key. Well, line 7 is downloading a custom executable, and then line 12 is actually executing that custom executable. So that's, that's great. That's kind of simple, though. In fact, I would say, go to the next slide. It's, I would say it's boring. I mean, look, you can definitely try. And like, if you're just getting starting out with this, like, definitely try the exact command. That's a good place to start but we can do a lot more with it. And, and that involves this register function. So this is from like the unofficial XLM documentation because it's so old, there's not really official documentation. Forgot a link to that, but I can get that out to everyone. But the idea here is this register function and on the next screen, I'll show you exactly how it works, but we can tap into some DLLs, uh, Win32 APIs and make some calls that we would need for process injection like virtual alloc. So in this case, this is just the gist of how it works. You specify a DLL that you want, the function you want to call, a method. Data types is, this is really where it gets annoying with this. The tech is so old school that there's like data types are by like J and the alphabet, like A, B, C, D, and it's really annoying. There's a little bit of documentation, but that's tough to figure out. You can set an alias for the function call name, and then the settings aren't super important. But that's how we just like register these DLLs in the process to use. And then we can call these functions. 
So as you can imagine, we can do things like registering virtual alloc, write process memory, and create thread to simply just write some shell code into our current Excel process and then execute it. Uh, and that's what this example is showing. But for shell code, it gets a little, a little tricky um, because sometimes we'll have non-printable characters. If you can go all alphanumeric, that's great. It makes it a little bit easier. But oftentimes, shellcode contains these non-printable characters. And Excel doesn't play super nicely with them in these uh, sheets. So for that reason, we have to do char encoding, I guess. So it's this equals char function. So what it would look like, I'm showing both the process injection and the shellcode. It looks like this. Like on the left, you've got all this process injection. On the right, you've got this these char. That's just our encoded shellcode. And then they work together, kind of just looping over row by row by row write process memory, injecting our shellcode into memory, and then we kick it off with create thread. So it's just a basic workflow of, of how process injection would work with these, these macros. And so we're going to demonstrate our tool just because it's, I don't know, it's our tool, and I, <laughs> I wrote it, so I figured it'd be helpful to show, and I know it better than the other tools. So the basic idea here is the Wover. I don't know if you know his tool to Donut. So basically, you can take a .NET assembly and convert that into position-independent position shellcode. Awesome tool. Accenture has a similar tool called Clairvoyant, also a great tool. The idea is we are taking a C-sharp DLL, like a template, that we use for all types of different engagements. And then we stick in our shellcode for, like, say, a Cobalt Strike beacon. And then we just like throw that into the tool. It does a few things, which I'll explain on the next slide, and spits out a text file that you just copy and throw in Excel. Super easy to use. And on the next slide, yeah, so uh, this is kind of under the hood how things are actually working. We just have to compile, compile the C-sharp code. Then we're going to use Donut and Clairvoyance to generate shell code from these .NET assemblies. Then we got to remove null bytes. Then we're going to encode it with all that char business that I mentioned before. We're generating that process injection workflow, and then we're combining it. And so like, we're not doing anything super special here. All this research was done by other folks. All that, all that we did was just kind of like put it together to make life a lot easier for somebody doing a red team or a pen test, just like spin this up or on the defensive side, just to test your own defensive technologies, just to spin this up rapidly instead of having to like manually fiddle with these char codes and it's a whole mess, which I've done and it, it's a mess. <laughs> we can also do a few things like sandbox checking, which is cool. Like, you know, is there a mouse? Like, can we play sound? Is this actually on a Windows machine? Like, there's just various things that we can do to make sure we're in the right spot. We can also do some environmental keying to make sure that we're on the right domain. We can check the date, things like that. Uh, we can do some light obfuscation as well, which, to be honest, I recently ran this through VirusTotal in preparation for this talk and compared it to the non-obfuscated one, and this was detected much more. So like, this is definitely not good to use at the moment. So it's, I mean, this is how it works. So it's iterative, right? You got to constantly be evolving your tooling versus the defensive tooling. And then I think with that, we'll do a quick, a quick demo. So this is classic 40 North style. We try to opt out of live demos in case something goes horribly wrong. So this is a video that I made a couple of days ago, but I will, I'll talk you through it. There's no audio. So it's just me narrating it. So this is the repository. And so this is just a, a quick demo if you want to use this tool, test out these macros. So there's a process injection template in there. Right now, there's just some shell code to pop calc that we built with MS Venom. We're just showing that. And then you can see here, this is just like easy process injection. In this case, we're creating a process in a suspended state. This is a little beyond the scope of, of, of this webinar, but it's a good idea to try to break the Excel parent-child process chain. So in this particular process injection sample, it, sample, we're creating a process in a suspended state so that we can inject into that and have it live separately from, from Excel. Excuse me. And so that's uh, the same file just with a Cobalt Strike Beacon payload in it. Just running the tool. And Matt, feel free to uh, skip through the tool running because it does take a little bit of, of time. But basically, this is just walking through those steps that we, we shared before, showing you that Cobalt Strike is open. And if you guys aren't familiar with Cobalt Strike, it's what we use and what we teach in our classes on just as a C2 software. 
I imagine most of you are probably familiar with it. You can skip ahead a little bit more, sir, if you don't mind. There we go. Okay, so once we have the output, it's going to give you a few little directions on what to do with it. But basically, we're going to take this text file and we're going to walk you through how to actually create one of these XLM like macro sheets, which is the first step, honestly. So we're going to copy all of this like char business that I mentioned before. And now we're in a Windows VM. That before was Kali. So you're going to right click on the bottom left so like where it says sheet one you can right click hit insert and then msxl 4.0 macros the sheet name so we paste that in there we do text to columns because it's semicolon the limited the eliminated i don't know how to say that maybe matt can help me with that one. Limited. Uh, <clears throat> sure. and then that's i mean that's pretty much it like, i mean i showed you guys some screenshots of what this looks like before but this is kind of how it is in action and this is pretty easy to kick off. You just hit run. And then we can check out Cobalt Strike to see if it came through. And yet there's, we got a peek in there. So that's, that's pretty much it. You can have the same functionality, the auto open functionality as other tools. Right there, you could see how we created that. Basically, you just have to rename the name of a cell. Cells are named like A1, B7. You can just rename them to auto open, uh, and that will provide that same functionality that you're probably familiar with with VBA. Uh, and that's pretty much it. It's um, just lastly, just demonstrating the auto open feature working. But that's the basics. And this isn't like an ad just for our tool. The only reason we show it is that I, we specifically built it because it was so frustrating doing this manually. But Macrome came out around the time that Excellent Donut did as well. And that's another great tool that does similar things. So like check out both tools and some of the other repositories that have interesting information on, on Excellent Macros. If we go to the next slide, just wanted to share a few more things about AV because I mentioned before that it is getting caught. And this is the result of that file that you just saw demonstrated. That's what happened when I uploaded it to Virus Total. And again, I only did that because that template that I used for process injection is publicly available. So I imagine somebody's already already done that. But there are a few things that we can do to evade antivirus. And please check out malware.pizza. That's the domain. So malware.pizza. So Michael Weber at Bouncy Hat, he's got two awesome blog posts. So if this is at all interesting to you and you want to use this on an assessment, check out these blog posts first because it will go deeply into how to evade antivirus. And I hope he does a talk at some point because it would definitely be worth it. But I'll briefly highlight a couple of things here. So the first is you can imagine antivirus signaturing on like a thousand char functions. Like that's kind of weird. How do we get rid of that? And then second, how do we hide macro sheets? So for these char functions, I'm on the left. You can see that's how it kind of looks now. But on the right, what we're doing here in B1, we're creating a, another function is basically what we're doing. It's called a subroutine in this case. And that subroutine is literally just returning the value of char plus shellcode. And in cell A1, we're setting shellcode equal to 65. And so, Matt, if you hit um, next twice, it's going to, yeah, and just one more time. Okay, so this is the pseudocode here. So, like, we're setting shellcode equal to 65, and we're calling this B1 function, and that's passing in the value of shellcode. So then when you print out A1 in this case, it would just print out A. So basically, it's equivalent to just calling char on 65, but we can do this row after row after row and not worry about calling char a whole bunch of times. So it's kind of a cool, a cool tactic that Michael Weber came up with. And then the other bit, and I imagine a lot of you are familiar with this, this isn't really anything new, but this is something we can also use for these macro sheets as well, is that in Excel, there are actually three visibility states for your sheets. In the GUI, there's two that you see, there's hide and unhide. And there you can see examples of it, but there's this third visibility state called very hidden. And the way you edit that, yeah, there we go. In, in Hex, there's articles about it. You can, we can paste one in here. I should have had that link in there. Sorry about that. You change the value to 0, 2, and that makes it very hidden. And so if you look at the bottom right screen, in that workbook, there's actually two sheets. But one of them, I manually edited the Hex, 
and now you can't see it in the GUI. And so like, if you guys know about this tactic, you know that some AV is, has already signatured this. Again, I'll refer you back to Michael Weber's blog because he did some more research on this specifically for Excel and macros and found a way to make it very hidden, but break that signature. A lot of really cool stuff in there. And I don't want to do a talk on his research. So I will leave that for, for you guys. But just the last couple quick thoughts on this in terms of other things that we can do to evade AV with Excel and macros. Think about how do we get rid of this auto open string? Like there's ways to do it. How do we use Unicode to like mess up defensive analysis? And then can we even get rid of that char call altogether? So there's a lot of interesting um, research going on. And again, I refer you to malware.pizza for those, those two articles. Okay. I'm going to keep talking for a little bit longer, then I'll pass it over to Matt in case hopefully you guys aren't too tired of, of hearing me talk. So this is Epic Manchego. So this is about new AV bypassing. And this came out, if you see the date of this blog post, September 1st, so a week ago. So like I added this in last night. And I added it in last night. I think it's cool. That's one reason. But the other reason is just to show you how we are constantly trying to stay on top of, I don't want to say trends, but like the latest tactics to make sure that our payloads execute in our target environments and actually get into the target environments. So Epic Manchego, it's, this is Inviso uh, Labs reporting and discovery. This is ZD, ZDNet coverage of it just two or three days ago. But the basic idea here is there is this .NET library called EP+, and that allows you to generate Excel workbooks. There's the, um, the repository. And you can go to the, ne the next slide. So this library allows you to do the same thing as if you were in Microsoft Excel. So if you're in Excel, you create a lot, um, I'm sorry, like a macro enabled workbook and you save it. That's great. That's one way to do it. If you take that same macro and you throw it through this EP plus .NET library, it's going to have a slightly different look to the underlying structure of the XML that embodies that XLSM file right? That macro enabled Excel file. So like we're going to take the same macro, create one with the actual Excel application and create the other one with this EP plus library. And it's going to look a little different. And why is that important? Well, there's two things. Well, there's many, but I'll cover two. One, when you use EP plus, there's no metadata created. If you're familiar with the XML structure of office files, you'll know on the right hand side, this doc props directory contains the metadata. So that's a file that we're looking at the underlying XML created with Microsoft Excel, the application. On the right-hand side of your screen, that's this where we created the same type of file with the same macro, but we used EP+, and there's no metadata. So like, that's cool. That's a good start. But the next slide is going to be even more interesting because if you're familiar with VBA, you'll know that a VBA project.bin file is usually created when you add macros to, to a workbook. Well, typically, when you use Microsoft Excel, Microsoft has a proprietary compilation algorithm that they compile your VB code, VBA code. EP Plus doesn't have access to that algorithm, obviously. So what they do is they compress your VBA code. And so if you just look at the byte size of each, the left again is with Excel and the right is with EP Plus, you can see the EP Plus version is about half the size. Now, is bigger, smaller, better? That might depend on the scenario. But that just goes to show you that these are structurally very different files. And that, based on Inviso's research, is what seems to be the reason that AV is having difficulty picking even just these super basic VBA macros, picking them up as malicious. And please check out Inviso's post on that. And then, okay. And so this is like prime example. So I uploaded a very simple simple macro that I created with EP plus and only three antivirus engines caught it. And this was yesterday. So this is definitely something that can work. And so we created this hot Manchego based off of their Epic Manchego uh, name. It's just a super simple tool that allows you to, and we're going to release this. If it's not public right now, we'll release it in the next hour. That allows you just to use this EP plus library, their DLL, and you could compile that yourself if you want. It's, it's open source. And you just provide a VBA text file, so a text file with your macro, and then an XLSM file, so a macro-enabled Excel workbook. 
and it will auto generate these files for you. And then you can test it out in your environment or for phishing or whatever you need to do. And with that, we'll do just a quick, quick demo on this one, just in case you guys want to see how the tool works and test it out in your environment. So the biggest thing to take note, I know the screen might be a little small. There are going to be videos posted, I believe. It takes two command line arguments. So one is just first a blank XLSM file. And the second is a text file.txt with your macro. All we're doing is just using this EP plus library to spin up a new workbook right in our macro. There you can see the macro on the right. In this case, the macro is just opening up calc. We're calling the shell command on it, which is like super obvious what we're doing here. That's why I say it's kind of strange that well, I uploaded one with the Cobalt Strike script in it. So that was the one that only had three alerting to it. But for demonstration purposes, we used calc. But so we'll, we compile this very simply. We just have to put a reference to the EP plus DLL, which is included in the repository. We call the executable, provide those two command line arguments. And then once we open up our file, you'll see it will have this enable content. And that means the macro was obviously in there and there's calc. So like, that's nothing fancy. This demo that you saw is not fancy at all. The tool's not fancy either. It's really just created super simple proof of concept to help defenders and offensive folks quickly just test this out to see if this is something that they can use or they can't detect, et cetera. Okay, this is the last, like you guys have like maybe seven more minutes with me and then I'm gonna give it to Matt and then you can just hear Matt for the rest of the time. So this is an example of social engineering required, right? This is where Microsoft says, thanks for the vulnerability report. This requires social engineering. This is really a feature by design. We're not going to fix this, whatever fixing means. So this is going to be a, a tactic that we saw published in April under the Ethan Hunt account. That's definitely not his name, but that's fine. And so the basic idea here is in PowerPoint, there are these things called actions. And so you can you know, put an action on a, like an image. You can put an action on a shape, on text. Actions come in two varieties. There are mouse click and mouse over. So like hover or click, right? And based on those, you can choose a few different things of what you want to have happen. In this case, and I, maybe the screenshot's a little small, I'm not sure, but we're going to be using this hyperlink to function. And basically the idea is normally somebody would say, I'm going to put like a reference to a workbook that I have or like a, I don't know, a document on my machine that like when I run through this presentation with somebody watching, I click on it, it automatically opens up that document. They can see it. It makes life a lot easier. So obviously we're going to repurpose that and we're going to host a payload remotely on a web dev server. And Black Hills has an awesome article about how to create uh, spin up web dev servers that I definitely recommend looking at. If you look at Black Hills and web dev, I'm positive it will be the first result. I've used that many times. And so we're going to make this like external reference to an external web dev server. And then we can throw like an HTA in there, a bat file, like whatever we want as the payload. And so the real magic here is if you, if you saw on the previous screen, if it wasn't too small, it said hyperlink to, and that was a local file. And I mentioned using a remote file in a web dev server. So the way we do that is we actually have to like dig into the XML that underlies the PowerPoint and change a few things. And I'll explain that in, in the quick brief demo that we have here, but that's where we would do it. Okay, so this is like a one minute, one and a half minute demo here. So I will narrate this. So this is just a fake, as you can imagine, a PowerPoint presentation. This little um, fake Windows Media Player can't play file thing is to go along with some pretext of that. This is a presentation and they're supposed to view our file. So I created an action under hyperlink. I said other file, and then I clicked the local file there. So that is referencing a local HTA file. This HTA is what we're going to use and also host remotely. But the basic idea is it's going to spin up calc as just to show you that you can do something with it. But also, it's going to open up a video in Internet Explorer to actually go along with this pretext. So it actually looks like you're clicking this Oh, the, the media can't play, but then the video actually comes up. So here, when you see I hover over it, it references a local file. You hit OK. So calc pops up. So that's kind of like the proof of concept that you can inject something in there. And then this is a video file from Vimeo. 
that we added in there. And I know that went by fast. Again, the videos will be available to view. But so like that was a local file that we hosted. So now what we want to do is we want to make that a remotely hosted file. And so the first thing that we have to do is we have to change the PPSX file. That just means a PowerPoint show presentation file. Change that to .zip. We're going to extract the zip files. And so that allows us to just mess with the XML. Under PowerPoint, slides, rels, and then slide three in this case, that's where the reference to that local file lives. You can see it highlighted there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to edit that uh, XML file to make it remotely hosted on a web dev server. Or sorry, reference a remotely hosted file on a web dev server. So there I'm typing in and just an IP address we had. Not anymore, don't worry. I tore down the uh, Apache server. And it says just like some random HTA file, right? And you could host it anywhere, obviously, just it has to be a web dev server. And so we're going to rezip the internal XML structure from this PowerPoint file. I named it use this dot zip. We're going to rename it use this dot zip to use this dot ppsx. Again, this ppsx file, if you're not familiar with it, is a file that you could send to someone so that they don't have to edit PowerPoint. It just shows up like a presentation like you'll see here. And so say they're clicking through, great. You have them click this, oh, I can't see this video, click it. Takes a little longer because these web dev requests do take a little longer than obviously a file on your local system. So maybe 10, 15 seconds. That was in real time right there. They have to navigate through this OK and run business, which people, we know they do. Not everybody, but some will do. And there's the same thing. You saw calc pop up and also a link to this video to go with the pretext. And so that's, that requires a little extra, right? If you go to the next slide, Matt, I share an example of a pretext that I would use for this. I started my career in sales. And so it wouldn't be weird for me to get on a phone call as a salesperson and somebody says, hey, Joe, I've got these great leads. Would you be interested in looking to my software and my services? And I'd be like, sure, I always need more leads. Salespeople love leads. Like that's how they live. They make money based on leads. So I would say, hey, I've got this new service to some salesperson at the target company. I want to share with you a little bit about it or give you some free leads or something. Set up a quick phone call. You send them that presentation beforehand. Walk them through it on the phone. I'm like, oh, you guys have to see this video, right? It might sound like a stretch. I know some of you might not do phone based social engineering. And if that's the case, I totally understand how that's, this might seem like something you might not do. I love phone based stuff. And this is definitely one that probably requires the phone. But that's the type of pretext that, that you could use. And there's, there's a lot of other ones as well. And to that end, this is like a project that's in its infancy. But if you're interested in contributing or taking a look at it, building a large collection of social engineering pretexts. It's definitely not large yet, but it's on GitHub. It's just open source. Anybody can contribute. But the idea is to put pretexts like that in there, along with the payloads and the goals, so that people can quickly search and figure out a pretext for their social engineering engagements. And with that, I think I can't talk anymore. My mouth is really dry. So I think, Matt, you can have to take over at this point. I, I can do that for you. And cool. that, this you, uh this pretext project is really cool. I took a look at it a little bit ago, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of potential there. I like that. So let's let's talk about some remote template injection here. So as for like a background of everything, of course, you know, document macros have been around for a long time, and they've been, I would say, overused for a long time. And originally, it really involved just writing some VBA code and putting that in the macro section, probably execute once the document gets loaded. Something I've done before is you'll have that original document in kind of an encrypted format or something like, you know, wingdings or some weird text that doesn't show up correctly. Once that user would enable the content, it would show up correctly and, and they would hopefully be none the wiser. But, you know, a lot of AV EDR products will detect this and they'll block any type of payload execution that it might see. But what's nice is we could actually host this malicious code remotely. Really, why would we want to do this? So, of course, there's always newer detection methods and they're always improving. 
you know, dropping malicious code, sending that in an email really isn't going to work anymore. Unless you, you know, heavy, heavily obfuscate or do something that uh, the email scanners won't detect. Another reason is a lot of email scanners will block dot doc or dot doc m attachments but it's nice that they just allow normal docx attachments of course because you have to email people documents and what's really nice about remote template injection is it doesn't include any malicious code initially so that first initial document that you send to the user is benign and doesn't include any in any type of stage or code it'll only contain a link to a malicious te template document that the, it'll then download and then they'll have to uh, enable macros from there. So kind of the credit and inspiration that I would, I would say for us looking into this goes to some of the authors over at Red, Extra, Blue. I used kind of their blog and guide as, as kind of a reference of, of how to do this. And, and it's, they have a, a really good research there, really good, good blog if you want to check it out. So how it works. So really, we'll just create a malicious macro. We'll create a template document, which is a .m. We'll embed our malicious macro in there. We'll throw it on like a web dev server or host it with Cobalt Strike, however you want to host that template document. And then we'll just create our phishing benign Word document that we'll send to that user that will then reference our malicious template. So. There's a bunch of different ways to generate that malicious macro. I won't go into detail here. You can use a few of these ones, Veil Unicorn Malicious Macro Generator, or just use the built-in Cobalt Strike Macro Generator. It's really up to you. There's a bunch of different options out there. But in order to create that Word template, we'll have to first enable that developer ribbon, just makes things easier. And then we'll open up a new Visual Basic Editor. We'll throw that macro in there. We'll save it as a .m, and it look, should look something similar to this on the right, where we have this workbook open, a bunch of malicious code in there. It's up to you to you know obfuscate it as best you can, but uh, it's not really a huge issue right now because we're not sending this. So once you want, uh, you know, save that, you'll want to at least I like to reopen it and enable content just to make sure that macro is actually working. And then I can move on to this next step of creating this benign docx file, just our normal phishing document that we'll send to the user. So this is going to load that template. You know, one quick method in order to create this template is you could use one of Word's online templates. Um, just select one that closely matches your scenario, or you could just create it from a blank document. It's really up to you. So kind of like Joe showed earlier, we'll have to modify some portions of this docx file. So how, all we have to do to do that is change that docx extension to the zip. We'll then unzip those files so we can edit kind of the settings within there. So you'll go into the word rels and then edit that settings XML rels file. And then you should see something kind of like this image here where you have this attached template and then the target variable there. You'll just want to replace that with whatever the URL address to that dot, dot M, that template document, the malicious one that you just created. You want to save everything uh, and then you'll go back to kind of that, uh, that uh, the folder where you unzipped everything to and you'll compress it from there. Um, and then once you modify that back to a docx, you should be able to just open it up again. And then you should have this enable macros pop up, come up. One thing that's kind of cool about this is opening that document does create multiple HTTP requests or HTTPS, depending on what you use. So even before they enable macros, you'll still get some of those metrics that, you know, they downloaded this or they opened this document. Uh, they might not have enabled macros, but at least, you know, it got to that point where they actually opened it. So all you have to do is just enable content and hopefully get some shells come in. Uh, so this is kind of a screenshot from Cobalt Strike once we hosted it. 
Uh, there's a couple of different uh, requests for that template document. Now I'll go through just a quick demo here. I think I sped it up, so if it, it's probably pretty quick. I apologize. But we're just creating a new Visual Basic editor. We're pasting our macro in there. And then we'll just save it as a template document anywhere, really. And then I think I close everything out. Yep. And then we will throw that into a Linux box. I'm just hosting it with Cobalt Strike. So that's why I threw it over on this side. And then we have this, just our normal benign document that we'll send to the user, create uh, or rename it to .zip, extract it, and then we can go through and then go into the settings file here and modify where that template gets pulled from. We'll just replace this whole section with our URL to that template document, and then go back and then rezip everything up, rename it to that docx, I just like to call it whatever the actual name was before. And then we should be able to, here we see there's, there's no, there's no um, beacons in there, nothing in there. We just have to host that template file quickly here. And then just call it something that, uh, you know, that you would remember, of course. Great. And now all we have to do is open up that, um, that dot, dot .x file, enable those macros. Or actually, before we enable, we can see the couple of uh, HTTP requests that are on Cobalt Strike. Enable those macros. We see the beacon come in. And uh, we can start hacking away. So that's kind of a cool, a cool way to not have to send any malicious code to the user initially. So if you are doing, of course, like email phishing, you know this is going to probably get through any type of email filters or anything like that. And then your malicious code would then be pulled later, later on. One nice thing is you know, if you potentially notice like a defender is looking at, at your code or, or defender is doing something or you want to kill the whole uh, phishing scenario uh, you can just kill that template document and then of course nothing will be pulled and executed uh, so inline shapes this is a, a different topic here kind of interesting um i think we stumbled on it probably a couple weeks ago but overall inline shapes there's a, a bunch of different types of ones there's charge charts comments uh you know pictures but we'll really be fo focusing on the text box shape. So I know threat actors are using this. Did see some mention of uh, you know documents that have this within them that were like thrown on Virus Total and like a bunch of other different products that would go through and and see what it's doing. But I would say it's not as common as just like plain VBA macros or something similar to that. So one way we can use this is we can use inline shapes shape objects to hold whatever malicious code we want which can then be compiled and, and called from a macro itself uh, so i'd say all the credit that uh for all this goes to this laughing mantis greg Linares, i believe that's how you pronounce his name He's done some really good research on this topic, and he was really the inspiration for you know looking into it and diving into it more, and and kind of seeing how I can uh, weaponize it a little bit uh, as well. So some caveats for this: uh, the idea overall is pretty basic, but uh, we like to think of it as, as more of a starting point for more advanced uses down the road. I didn't really want to focus on obfuscation here. I just wanted to really get it to work. So that really wasn't my main goal starting out. So really the, the main execution flow of this, and we'll talk about some more ways to um, you know, add in some more creativity here. But we'll create that phishing document. Uh, we'll then use a 
macro to create an inline shape within the document. Uh, we'll delete that macro and then add in the macro to execute that inline shape. And then all we have to do is save the document and then send it. Uh, so let's do this. So I used Veil for this. I, I swear we're not biased. I know Chris wrote it. But uh, this is what I use because it's easy. It's what I know. So really, you can use any macro creator you want. All we really need is this PowerShell payload and execution strings. You don't really need all the other extra stuff with it. And I'll kind of show you, show you why here in a second. So once we have that payload, we'll want to create that text box macro that will create that inline shape. So the uh, text box macro here is at the right. I just posted in all of that macro data underneath that. And then this bottom, this bottom screenshot is really kind of where all the magic happens, where it's creating a text box. It's adding this text within there. And then that's what it's pulling from, which I'll show you uh, in the next slide here. We'll want to create, uh, at least make sure that it's not visible. So this dot visible variable setting, uh, we'll just make sure that's uh, set to false. And then uh, this key at the top, sorry, I went a little too, too fast. The key value at the top is kind of a kind of a secret key that it gets added in. And uh, so you'll see on the next slide here, when we try to execute this, it'll search the entire document for all the shapes. And then it'll search for this specific key within all of those shapes shape settings within there. So it'll search for the specific key. Once it finds it, it'll then run it. And we can kind of see that here. If you create, uh, this is the kind of the auto open or you know macro that gets created that'll execute that shape. So we have the key here that matches the key in the shape itself. We're just iterating through all the shapes in there. And then once it finds that key, it can then pull out the data from that shape. And then we're using the call by name function to execute whatever was in there. And then, sorry, let me go back here. So one quick note is this does include this PowerShell.exe string here. I tried to split it up, but that's kind of useless because it gets concatenated and then entered in the shape. But I'll show you a way around that here in a second. So the next thing you want to do is you want to save that macro enabled document and then just send it out. The one main thing is it's going to really stop users from looking at the macros and looking at your payload, but it's probably not really going to stop reverse engineers very much. The macro can only, uh, can only be executed once unless you change the settings a little bit which is generally good. So it'll be executed once for whoever downloads that macro but, or that document, but it'll still be living, of course, on like the email server and, or however you sent that document out. And, and it does this because it deletes that shape after running so that payload data is no longer available, which I mean, it's pretty nice to have that. So... Uh, you will have to send that weaponized document, uh, that weaponized document. So it's a good idea to look into further obfuscation. But one thing we could do, or a couple different things we could do to bypass AV, we could uh, remove that PowerShell call from that text box and place it within that execution, that call by name function. So right now, if you followed all these directions, Defender will catch it, unfortunately. But modifying these two, two different things will let it bypass Defender, and by Defender won't, won't flag on it from there. So in the previous couple of slides ago, this text frame variable that had that PowerShell uh, split up string within there, so I just removed that and then placed it inside the call by name function at the bottom here, just hard coded PowerShell at IDXE in, because I know that's what I wanted to run 
modified these CMB params just a little bit to point to the actual parameters that I wanted to pull and add into there. And then it gets bypassed. So what's cool is we just learned about, you know, pulling code remotely using remote template injection. Well, you can also do that with this as well. You can add these two together. So we can combine that remote template in injection with these inline shapes, which is nice because we won't have to send that docm, that malicious, or yeah, the macro enabled document as a phishing document. So we'll just send a regular docx and uh, it'll pull that code and then execute. And then similar to remote code or uh, remote template injection, we can kill that template to disallow any of that payload detonation as well. So we'll go through just a, a quick demo here. And I just, I turned real-time protection on and all that just to make sure it would work. But uh, we're just going to go to macros. I'll create um, just a, a T1 for now. It doesn't really matter. But then I'll paste in this text box creation macro eventually. Yep. And so this is going to run. It'll create that inline shape, add the specific variables to it. There's no PowerShell in this one for that dot text variable. All we have to do is run it and then delete it because that shape gets created. And then we will add in our auto open macro. And then that's all we have to do. This one does have that PowerShell. And then I modified the parameters to point to the correct ones as well. And then just a, a couple other sub uh, auto open functions just to make it uh, work with, with all versions. We'll save it as a macro enabled document. And then close everything out. Make sure there's no beacons or listeners running correctly. We will then uh, just open up that document we created. It'll run, enable content, and then we should see that beacon come in. That PowerShell window does spawn pretty quickly, but there are ways to get around that as well. So yeah, that's it. That's kind of, I would say, more of an intro to uh, inline shapes. Uh, I know there's a lot of different work that can be done to this, a lot of obfuscation and different techniques. But yeah, just a, a cool little starting point there to use something other than just specifically macros with, with that malicious code. So we are still using malicious documents on red team assessments. There's three of them that we really primarily use. We'll use probably Joe's tool to create those XLM macros, depending on the scenario. We might use that remote template injection or some kind of new AV obfuscation with uh, another interesting VBA payload that uh, we might have discovered from there. So a bunch of different options, depending on the scenario to use. But uh, options are good. We always like several different ways to do the same thing. Uh, and this is just a, a kind of a final slide. We don't really need to go through it. But we'll just be teaching initial access operations with Wildwest Hacking Fest. I think we talked about that before. And then with that, that's it. Thank, thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I have to end it to see any messages. But, and and yeah. definitely a thank you to Black Hills for, for the invitation. We love being here and uh, hopefully everybody can take away a few little nuggets of information, another tactic or two here to implement today or tomorrow on, on an assessment. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Wonderful presentation. Just one, one, a couple questions, but one that everyone's asking is when is the Hotman Chango going to be released to the public? Yes, so we will uh, we'll take care of that in maybe 30 minutes, maybe maybe <laughs> an hour. We'll, t we'll tweet it out on 40 North Sec is our Twitter uh, handle, but then we'll also post it in Discord as well once that link is live. But we'll do that right after this presentation. Perfect. Sounds good. Any final words, guys?
Nope. No pressure. I don't think so. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you so much for for having us. Really, really appreciate it. Love being here. Absolutely. It was our our pleasure, definitely. And thank you guys for tuning in. Um, We will post the recording in a couple days. Ryan's been doing a great job of just getting them out within days instead of weeks. So we will post that here in the Wild West Hack and Fest Discord server. We'll also make it a blog post so you can always find it on the YouTube channel. And with that, we'll say thank you and we'll let you have your day back. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye, guys.